our boy, as we say, you know, he's our boy. He's, uh, uh, you know, he's worked in Delhi for quite some time. He was with us since, uh, as a fellow in pediatric intensive care. And, uh, and a word about Anil, you know, me and Anil go back to uh, more than 33 years when we are together as senior residents in the pediatrics department and uh, all of us were being encouraged by uh, Dr. Arya to take up some branch or the other. Anil, of course, took up the hardest branch to do, and that is pediatric intensive care. I was so uh, hard working, so I took pediatric hematology oncology. Leli. And the great thing about Anil was that he, uh, Dr. Chug may have been the face, but he was the one who used to hold the fort uh, in intensive care in uh, in pediatric intensive care in Gangaram Hospital. So, uh, you know, uh, he, he was one of those who uh, quietly and tirelessly worked in intensive care and uh, made a name for himself uh, through sheer dint of hard work. Uh, 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 I know, I, um, you know, I'd like to introduce Dr. Shiv Gupta, मेरी कर्म भूमि तो यू नो दिल्ली है पर जन्म भूमि पंजाब है एंड आई वर्क इन लुधियाना वेयर डॉक्टर शिव गुप्ता इज रिजाइड्स टुडे फॉर 3 इयर्स डिड माय डीसीएच एंड एमडी देयर डॉक्टर शिव गुप्ता इज अ वेरी वेरी यू नो यंग एंड अपकमिंग पेडिट्रिशियन फ्रॉम द स्टेट ऑफ पंजाब वेल नोन has uh, become the EB of the uh, Indian Academy of Pediatrics. He's running a big hospital there and uh, is doing a great job about it. Now I'll request Dr. Anil to take over and introduce the other chairperson. Thank you, Dr. Anupam, for the kind words. Uh, so I, am, I have the pleasure to introduce Dr. Vinayak Kibatki, old friend of mine and uh, we have been associated for almost a decade now, more than a decade. And we have been meeting in the executive meetings and the, you know, uh, and the conferences. So Dr. Patki currently is the chief consultant and head department of pediatrics and neonatology at Ushakal Abhinav Institute of Medical Sciences, Sangli, Maharashtra. So welcome, Dr. Patki. So Thanks. I think... Welcome, uh, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invite, sir. Welcome, sir. So, I, may I ask Dr. Maninder to start his, the deliberations? Uh, sir, uh, just a moment. We would also like to uh, welcome Dr. Lalit Mendirata, mm -hmm. sir, who has also joined us. Yeah. Welcome, yeah, sir. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Mukesh. I think it is always a wonderful to have the esteemed faculty with us and discussing very important topics, I think, basic ventilation. And we have Maninder. We all know how competent he is working in ICU in Vedanta and now in Faridabad, Amrita Hospital. And along with that, I welcome the chairperson and our Shay Gupta, who is friend of mine in the EV for last two years. So I welcome all. I will not come in between Meninder and the basic neonatal vent basic ventilation. So let's, I think we can start. Thank you very much. Okay, young smart man, Dr. Maninder, go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you all. Uh, okay, is the screen visible, sir? Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, screen is visible. It's full screen and you're audible too, Dr. Maninder. Okay. So, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Delhi IAP, for giving us a chance to present. Uh, it looks like a simple topic, but actually it's very complicated. And I'll try to keep it simple, as simple as possible. So, there's no financial interests. Uh, trying to uh, keep it as simple. So, there are two parts. Non-invasive ventilation, which is for a milder disease which can include your BiPAP, CPAP, and including HFNC. Or it can be invasive, invasive ventilation where you put an endotracheal tube and it is for a severe and a progressive disease. Okay. So uh, this is the how the ventilators uh, progressed over the years, the machine. And similar to that is the mobile phones. So again, highlighting the basic mobile phone does all the job. And most of the buttons in your advanced mobile phones, you hardly press. So basis is very, very important. And the advances can only be done once you're clear with the basic. 
So don't forget the basics. And basically, what is a uh, what is a mode? Mode is actually a union between a patient and a machine. And in that, in between comes the doctor who attaches both the patient and the machine. And many of the times you'll hear something which is called as ventilator induced lung injury. But uh, I personally feel it's not a ventilator induced lung injury. It's due to the wrong basic settings. That's why I personally call it a physician induced lung injury. But we have named it as ventilation induced lung injury. So highlighting that patient safety is very important and it's important that you start using these filters uh, even for your normal day-to-day -day practice. You can use this uh, antibacterial viral filters and there's something which is HME and there's something with the HME and bacterial filter. So if you're using a HME and bacterial filter actually separate, be careful what you're using and for what purpose. So in the expiratory limb, near the expiratory flow sensor, you can keep the viral filters so that the viruses and bacteria get trapped over here and near the patient you can keep a HME if you want. This is a heat moisture exchanger. Nowadays, most of the adult or adolescent ventilations, we don't use a wet humidifier. We use HMEF. In between, I'll stop and ask Anil sir for his comments also. So what is your uh, take on HMEF versus wet humidifier in your unit, sir? Anil sir? Yeah, sir. Yeah, Maninder, we are the uh, same way. Uh, we are using HME uh, uh, in all the patients except for the very small kids because of the weight of the HME. Sometimes there's a, there's a risk of kinking of endotracheal tube. So we use uh, wet uh, this uh, heated humidifiers uh, for the small kids. And in special situations where uh, there is a bleed or there is a lot of soiling and a lot of uh, secretions, you know, copious secretions are coming. In those situations, we use uh, heated hum uh, humidifiers. Otherwise, in the majority of the patients, we use HME. We are not right. using viral filters at all. We are not using them. We are otherwise we are just taking care of cleaning of the uh, transducers and everything is done after each use in a, in each patient. Ah, so, so expiratory limb uh, uh, placing a filter is very optional, and if a ventilator company advises you, you can uh, place it. Otherwise, it's not mandatory. Uh, so always we use the cuffed endotracheal tube. We hardly use the uncuffed tube in our practice. And uh, we use the aneroid meter. If you don't have an aneroid meter, you can make this Indian jugard. So I have to keep the pressure between 20 and 25. Or if you have an aneroid meter, then start using this. It's not expensive. And daily you can check the cuff pressures. Closed ET suction versus open ET suction. Uh, we preferably use closed ET suction. What is your practice, Anil sir? My experience with closest ET suction is not good. And even my nurses are not very happy to use them, especially in small kids because of the loss of the tidal volume. So right. we don't use them. Until unless a child of ARDS, adolescent patient where, you know, every time you do suction and there is a de-recruitment, in those selective cases, uh, we are using close ET suction. But in routine cases, we don't use ET like this. And in routine cases also, there is no need for, there is no, uh, you know, uh, uh, written order about the ET suction. It's only when we see the secretions in the tube, then only we do the suction. Otherwise, we don't do the suction. Agreed, sir. So we also practice the same. Only in ARDS, in refractory ARDS, we might apply a closed ET suction. Otherwise, yes. we follow a open ET suction. Next thing is how to set up a ventilator. So you should know your equipment and your interfaces. So once you're using an equipment like this, you should know there's a heated tube and there's a particular cannula. Not necessarily this machine. There can be many different types of machine and they might have different interfaces or cannulas, RAM cannula and others. You should be familiar with the equipment and the interface. Both are very much important. Uh, if you are using an NIV, then, then you should know what are the particular equipment needs, like head straps, circuits. If it's a two-level circuit or it can be a single limb circuit, then the interfaces can be your uh, alone nasal or it can be oro nasal or full face mask and definitely the ventilator. They can be ventilators, such big ventilators, or they can be small portable ones also. So you should know your NIV equipments before you start practicing it. 
you can use a wet humidifier or you can also place a HME over here. And uh, if there's a two limb, a uh, non-invasive, then again, this HME can be used. It's not necessary in an NIV, you have to use a wet humidified circuit. Uh, then you should know the various tubings that are available. So if it's a less than 10 kg in our unit, we always use a wet humidifier and it's a double heated circuit and the trial water is used for the uh, humidification. And if it is more 10 to 25 kgs, we have pediatric tubings and we prefer to use our HMEF. Or it's an adult, more than 25 kgs, we use the adult tubings. Remember, once you're using these non-heated or non-wired tubings, you have to use a HMEF filter. Otherwise, patient will be getting only cold and uh, non-humidified air, and that will cause more lung injury. And all uh, in adults also, you get double heated uh, or double wired circuits are also available. So once you're using the wet humidifier, don't use a HMEF. These are some basic things, but they are very much required. Again, once you start your ventilator, you should know what patient you are applying. Because once you say you have taken a neonatal ventilator or a pediatric ventilator, adult, the machine has inbuilt parameters that it knows which circuit is going to be attached, what is the bias flow that machine has to give. So it's very important, once ever you start a ventilator, always check out and then you place whether it's a neonatal patient or a pediatric or an adult patient. And it's good if you start entering the weight of the patient also. And only after you do that, then you do a checkout and complete the checkout and make sure everything is passed. Most of the times the flow sensor is failed. That means your ventilator will not give a correct tidal volume to the patient. And if his oxygen sensor is failed, then FIO2 delivery will not be proper. These are the two basic alarms that keep on coming. And if you bypass them, it will be bad for the patient. So the type of patients that we see in our day-to-day -day practice can be pneumonia, or it can be asthma, shock, head injury, or GBS or simple post-op patients. These are the type of patients that we see. Now the it, physiology is important and as per that, we have to keep the uh, ventilator settings. So if it's a ARDS, it's a stiff lung or a pneumonia. It needs more PEEP to open up that closed alveoli and it leads low tidal volume because if you give high tidal volume, it's going to cause lung injury and maybe pneumothorax. You have to tolerate high CO2 if it's a purely ARDS patient. So low tidal volume will cause a high CO2. Do not worry about it. If it is an asthma patient, it's over distended black lung. The air is going in but gets trapped inside, doesn't come out. So it needs more E time, more expiratory time. And the more air you push in, more it gets trapped. So be careful. Do not give high respiratory rate or high tidal volume. Both of this will cause the lung to get overinflated. So in asthma, you need less PEEP, less respiratory time, and more expiratory time. So as to give time for the trapped air inside the lung to come out. If it's a shock patient, there's a lot of capillary leak and fluid overload. It mimics ARDS. So intubation over here or a non-invasive ventilation will help in work of breathing. Increased PEEP is very much good over here. Now comes a problem with head injury. Head injury might have a normal lung or abnormal lung, but we need to protect the airway. And over here, high CO2 is bad. So do not target a very low CO2 or a very high CO2. The dictum over here is basically normocapnia, normoxemia, normothermia, and important is safe intubation. While intubating, see that the cervical uh, cord does not get damaged and also you do not uh, make sure that CO2 does not should rise when you are intubating a patient. If it's a post-op patient and it's a normal lung or it's a gullian Mare patient, then you have to give a normal tidal volume and a normal rate to the patient. The normal tidal volume can vary from 8 to 10 ml per kg and normal rate is a physiological rate. This is a brief snapshot of all the patients that comes into PICU. Dr. Maninder, may I speak a little bit now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, please. Uh, I just want to uh, re-emphasize that uh, mechanical ventilation is a supportive treatment. Okay? It is not going to change the basic disease. So do not forget to continue with your treatment of the basic disease. The, the etiological diagnosis need to be treated. So remember, when you're putting a patient of asthma, you have to 
continue with your bronchodilator therapy just putting ventilator is not going to reverse the bronchospasm it may get worsen with the asthma similarly for the shock <coughs> similarly for the shock you have to treat the patient uh, with the fluids and the inotropes so and even in gillen barre syndrome uh, maninder said 8 to 10 ml per kg but even if if that tidal volume is higher for the patient it may cause uh, ventilator induced injury to the to the lungs so you have to be very very cautious and continue to treatment or intensify the treatment of the basic disease that is the cause for the respiratory failure thank you sir thank you sir thank you sir for that uh now uh, coming on to the rapid cqs intubation because every physiology the intubation will happen if you are going for invasive so it's pneumonia and ards we usually follow midas fenta and rocuronium in our unit if it's asthma we prefer being a bronchodilator like ketamine and rocuronium if the patient is again having shock the rapid cqs we prefer to use a ketamine rocuronium and a fluid bolus or maybe simultaneously start inotrope so these uh, shock and head injury might not be anatomically difficult airways but they are physiologically physiologically difficult airways so if you intubate and the bp falls in shock it will be very bad uh second uh, head injury we give lignocaine then fenta midas and rocuronium and in golian bare fenta is midas rocuronium it's not fixed but again giving a snapshot that these might be the preferred drugs that you can use for intubating a patient use of paralyzing agent only if one is very confident or if there is one more trained doctor is present then you should uh, give a paralyzing agent so this is how we imagine intubating a patient without paralysis is criminal yes that that is also the patient resident it is no it is not advisable maninder i disagree with you you have to paralyze because even in the gb people will think that the patient is paralyzed why should i give a, a muscle relaxant but the masseters are the last muscle to get involved in any disease correct sir correct so masseter so, it is extremely difficult to open the clenched teeth you will cause more injury to the teeth and the tongue and the oral cavity and extremely Agreed. important in pneumonia and ards and asthma patients to check the fluid level the intravascular volume of these patients these patients may not be in shock but when you paralyze them when you give them sedation they will suddenly have fall in blood pressure tachycardia because of the very 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 closely balanced intravascular volume so it is not good it is a good practice to give a small fluid bolus in these patients because these patients are sick they have not eaten and drunk anything in the last few hours so the moment you give them drugs they will go into shock they will develop hypovolemia hypotension and uh, hypoperfusion that's very important correct sir so usually we uh, follow the sedation analgesia and paralysis and uh, we should give all three and if possible because we nowadays do not just intubate for saving a life it has to be a uh painless intubation and a comfortable intubation also dr maninder one thing out of this thing which one to choose you have written all the three in all the conditions right which one you use uh, which one is among like you have written midas panadol rocuronium are there specific indication for each one or you can use any one so uh, so uh, midas will be a sedation sir fenta will be a analgesia and rocuronium will be paralyzing agent so okay. we have to use sedation analgesia and paralysis ketamine can both be sedation and analgesia rocuronium is paralyzing agent right and in shock you have to make sure that you have given a bolus before going for the paralysis i agree so if you have used midas in a shock or fenta in a shock it will actually cause the bp to fall so it's okay. important that we give a fluid bolus or start ketamine all right thank you so uh, again this is how we expect our lung to look like this is how we see the lung in our x rays also one big balloon but it's not that it's actually many many million small balloons these are all the alveoli that is so lung unit is actually so many different size balloons though it appears like one in your x rays but it's not that so coming to this uh, everybody says pressure mode is safe mode so a 10 kg child pip of 20 peep of 7 fio2 of 60 that was when we intubated the kid after uh, 24 hours we saw that the, the 10 kg child peep is not 6 fio2 is 50 the x ray looks better the child also looks better and uh, then we see at the same pip and the same peep there is a pneumothorax 
So when the PIP was not crossed, why did the patient have pneumothorax? So it's important that you we all understand that once you're using a pressure mode, that's a fixed variable. And what's a dynamic variable is a volume. So volume gets changed if the compliance of the lung improves or decreases. Now at this PIP of 20, the tidal volume which was being given to this stiff lung was 60. Now as the patient improved, if you continue to give the same PIP, the tidal volume now is 120. And if you do not decrease the PIP, now tidal 120 means almost it is uh, very high for a 10 kg child. So if you're not decreasing the PIP, then we'll land up in trouble. So it's important that we understand that pressure mode is not a safe mode. Pressure mode or a volume mode, both are equally dangerous. It's We have to monitor the other variable. If you're using a volume mode, then the pressure gets varied. If you're using a pressure mode, the volume gets varied. And it's not the PIP of 20 or a PIP of 14 pneumo will not happen. The compliance will determine whether the tidal volume is sufficient enough to cause a pneumothorax. Uh, so let's start with the ARDS case. A two-year-old, 10 kgs, had the fever cuff for four or five days, breathlessness, no real intake for two days. And the child just came to emergency, conscious, irritable, saturation is 80% on room air, heart rate is 160, CRT is okay, cool extremities, BP is 80 by 40. For a two-year-old, seems okay, bilateral crepitations and breath sounds are present. So in this particular setting, this is the x-ray which was done. So if you see in this patient in the emergency, we know it's a respiratory failure, though the conscious and circulatory looks okay. So we started oxygen by high non rebreathing mask, bolus was given, IV antibiotic, distress persisting, saturation was almost 90% on a non rebreathing mask. So the next, next step over here, mostly because the conscious circulation seems okay, might be we'll apply some HFNC or BiPAP. Now, the, the whole concept of a non-invasive ventilation is that instead of this patient who is working, and this is a doctor who's looking at the patient working, having intercostal interactions, we have some machine which gives support to this patient. This machine can be either HFNC or it can be BiPAP, which gives some support. Now, the difference between HFNC and BiPAP is HFNC gives variable P and almost no PIP, whereas BiPAP gives a fixed P, double EP, and a good PIP also. So BiPAP is definitely a better machine in a patient who has respiratory failure, whereas HFNC is most likely next to the non-rebreathing mask and not much of advantage. So now, now if we start this patient on a BiPAP, so is this ARDS? Now, just to clarify, uh, diagnosis of ARDS, now a 2023 definition has come. Uh, so age, uh, we all know timing is within seven days, not explained by cardiac failure, fluid overload, and new opacities, unilateral or bilateral. So even if there's unilateral AR is there, that is sufficient to uh, label it. Now there is oxygen threshold to diagnose possible ARDS. Now possible ARDS is once you're using a nasal CPAP or a HFNC, and it is more than 1.5 liter per kg per minute, and the SF ratio is less than 250, then it is called as possible ARDS. And if you're you are using either nasal CPAP or uh, HFNC, and you're using some oxygen delivery device, then it can be called as at-risk PRDS, where you give some supplementation to maintain a saturation more than 88% and does not meet the above criteria. So there are two things you should know. There's something called as possible ARDS and there's something called as at-risk ARDS. Now, how to define ARDS? Now, earlier I defined what is at-risk and possible. Now, what is ARDS? So chest imaging, we have already discussed. No oxygenation index. If you're using invasive mechanical ventilation, oxygen index should be more than four. And if you're using non-invasive ventilation with a PEEP of more than five and SF ratio less than 250, then you can call it as ARDS. And further classification, whether it is mild or moderate or severe, will be done after four hours of initial diagnosis. So I've applied a mask now. Then after four hours, I'll see if the OI is still less than 16, I'll call it mild moderate. And if the OI is more than 16 in an invasive ventilated patient, I call it severe ARDS. 
Now the definitions have been made very, very clear. I don't think so. It can go any simpler than that. What is your take on that, uh, Dr. Anil sir? Or Dr. Vinayak? On yeah, the man, yeah. So I am, I am, uh, you know, when in February twenty three they released the published the guidelines or uh, this consensus on the on the ARDS pediatric ARDS. It was a great great relief because we had been diagnosing, mm -hmm. you know, very few cases of ARDS based on the previous definitions, but now with the with the use of mild moderate combining. And the severe, now we have only two categories of ARDS. It's either mild, moderate or severe. And the definitions, they have given the cutoffs. So they have liberalized the use of uh, terminology of uh, uh, ARDS. So now we have lots of cases which will be diagnosed as ARDS. And that will be good for, uh, for the developing countries where we can do a lot of research on these patients. Because in our country or in developing countries, third world countries, the cause of ARDS are very different from the developed countries. Exactly. So we, are, we are struggling with the you know tropical diseases and uh, infections causing ARDS. While over there, the causes are trauma and uh, congenital problems. I agree, sir. So that is that is very important, and it it, it has really opened the the uh, not the venue to uh, uh, diagnose ARDS very frequently now. Right. So we all we also feel the same, sir. It's actually becoming much and much better. Though it took 10 or 12 years, but it's much better now. So in this patient, after four hours on NIV IPAP of 14 and EPAP of 6, we found a SF ratio of 91. So it's pediatric ARDS and it comes into severe type also. So in this patient, NIV is failing because patient sensorium is worsening. The uh, BP is okay, but the saturation is falling, agitation and irritability due to hypoxemia. Patients require intubation. We use curved DT tube. And now comes the ventilator strategy in ARDS. So the most important thing over here is do no harm to the patient. That is lung protective ventilation. So if you understand, it's a stiff lung. There's volume loss. That means the lung, which was earlier very big, now is totally become white. And it doesn't require much volume because it is converted into a baby lung now. The adult or adolescent lung has now become very, very small. It requires very low tidal volume. It doesn't require high. And the lung is very heterogeneous. Some are flooded alveoli. Some are collapsed. Some are actually distending better. Some have a good FRC. So ventilation-induced lung injury is very, very important when you are dealing with ARDS. So for a low volume or a baby lung, you require low tidal volume. That is 4 to 6 ml per kg. Or some people might start with 6 to 8 also. But four to six is what we usually prefer with. And because it is heterogeneous, so a good amount of PEEP will usually be required in a white lung. And that is the importance of giving a PEEP that is do not allow alveolar collapse. And then keep the lung which are expanded and keep it open by giving the PEEP. Keep, try to reduce your FiO2 to as low as 60 as soon as possible. Don't over inflate by giving high tidal volume or high PEEP. Plateau pressure keep less than 28 in a normal ARDS or if a child has a lot of chest wall edema like in a dengue capillary leak, then plateau pressure can be kept less than 32. And you can use either mode. So, so which mode do you use in your unit if given a choice? Pressure or volume, not the PRVC, sir. Which one do you use in your unit? We, we are using a PRVC, but it is a, a decelerating flow. So over right. here, the volume is guaranteed, but you can use any mode. It doesn't matter. So which mode? Many people ask, sir, which is a safe mode and uh, which mode should be used in what disease? What is your answer for that, sir? You can use any mode, but you should know what you are setting on the machine and what you need to monitor. That is the most important. And always keep physiology or pathophysiology of the disease in mind whenever you're setting the ventilator. All ARDS right. patients are not same. All asthma patients are not same. They are individual patients. So you have to learn, you have to understand the pathophysiology or physiological mechanics of that particular patient and then set the machine. Agreed, sir. Agreed. Point well taken, sir. So just I've written some parameters. Don't find the 
uh, follow them blindly. So if you're using a pressure mode, you have to look at volume. And if you're using a volume mode, you have to check the pressure. You always check the other thing. One is a fixed variable, other will be dynamic. So if you're using a volume mode, you can start with six ml per kg. And uh, if you're using a pressure mode, then check what is the expiratory tidal volume and it should come around six ml per kg because chest rise can be subjective between doctor to doctor. So it's important that in a pressure mode, you apply some PIP, not 20, some PIP and look at the expiratory tidal volume and it should come around six ml per kg. The PEEP is constant in both. It's a baseline variable and FIO to an I ratio will be same. Rate is basically a little higher than the physiological rate. So these are the basic initiation uh, parameters that we want to put. Most important is what your nurse is familiar with. Use that mode because that will cause less disaster in the unit. But overall pressure control has a favorable gas distribution. But personally, we also do not use either of the modes. We use PRVC mode after we have initiated a ventilator. So if you're using a pressure mode, look at expiratory tidal volume, compliance, leak, saturation, and PaCO2. And if you're using a volume mode, look at plateau pressure, compliance, expiratory tidal volume, leak, saturation, and ETCO2. So optimal PEEP is what is required. That means it recruits and reduces oxygen requirement and helps to take part in gas exchange. And also PEEP should be avoided to avoid uh, atlectotrauma. Now I'll just show you uh, what this PEEP means. Now this alveoli, if it's having zero PEEP, it will collapse. Now this is actually very, very bad. We don't want this type. So this is not going to take part in any gas exchange. Now, if I inflate it, this is the FRC. Now, this gas at the end of expiration also is taking part in gas exchange. CO2 is getting uh, changed over here. So that's why this is a bad alveoli. This does not help in gas exchange. This is the FRC. This helps in gas exchange. This is the tidal volume that we want to give. So if I always deflate it, so it will cause lung injury because alveoli is getting collapsed and then expanded. And it requires more energy to inflate a collapsed alveoli. Whereas if there is a particular FRC and then I give a low tidal volume, it is very easy. Easy for the patient and easy for the ventilator also and it causes less of lung injury. This is what we want to highlight that do not be afraid of PEEP. High PEEP in a lung which is totally white is sometimes essential but make sure that you do not lose your blood pressure. Sometimes when you're giving high PEEP the blood pressure actually falls. So whenever you do some recruitment you have to look at the saturation, compliance and BP should be okay. Make sure all these three things are improving. So if the saturation is improving, but CO2 is rising, that means you are doing something wrong. Because if a new alveoli is getting recruited, then the CO2 should actually fall. And if the BP is falling, then there'll be a VQ mismatch. It will be detrimental. So be aware that high PEEP can cause decreased venous return, hypotension, and also barotrauma. So this is what we uh, want to say, this decelerating flow, what Sir told. This is the pressure mode. Over here, the pressure remains constant and this is decelerating flow. Whereas in the volume mode, the volume remains constant and the flow is constant, whereas the pressure changes with every breath. So this is pressure limited with decelerating flow and this is volume limited with constant flow. And what SIR and our unit uses is something called as the PRVC mode. PRVC is actually a pressure mode that is a decelerating flow with assured volume. It's actually a dual mode. So in this patient, the OI came to be 27 severe ARDS, low tidal volume ventilation, plateau was tried to keep between 28 and optimal peak. Now what is plateau pressure? That also becomes very important. So how do we normally breathe? Is it a pressure breath or volume breaths? So we usually have a sine wave, but the first one that you see is a constant weight pattern and the second one that we see is a decelerating so decelerating has a variable flow pattern and once you are running you need high flows whereas volume mode will always give a constant flow 
So if you see the flow time scalar in your graphics, you'll find that the first one is a volume mode, that's a constant flow, whereas the second one is a decelerating flow, there's a pressure ventilation. This is just to highlight that you should know the differences between them. Now, this is a ventilator piston and these are the alveoli. So this is a pressure time scalar that comes in your ventilator. So when the piston goes down, so it, it pushes some air, which is required to bypass the resistance of the endotracheal tube and the airways. So the pressure initially rises, but you see the alveoli do not fill. So this is the amount of pressure initially, which rises straight required to bypass the resistance of ET and the airways. Whereas now if I put the ventilator more in, now the alveoli starts rising and this becomes the P peak. That is the total pressure which is there in the system, which includes the alveolar distending pressure as well as the resistance of the airway. Now this P peak is not so important for us. What is important is the alveolar distending pressure. So in a volume mode, if I apply a pause where the ventilator stops during inspiration and now it measures the pressure at the end of pause that is near zero flow is taking place that is the plateau pressure and this is the pressure that we want to keep less than 28 in the normal ARDS or in a chest wall edema we want to keep it less than 32. So this is the importance of plateau pressure you there are many different ways of calculating it but preferred is in a volume mode apply a inspiratory hold and measure the plateau pressure. And the difference between the P peak and the P plat, if the difference is high, then you know the problem is in the airways or the endotracheal tube is getting kinked. But if the P peak and P plat both are rising, that means the problem is in the lung. So uh, if there is time, I'll show you in the end how to measure plateau pressure. So this is what normal is. The difference is usually less than five, but if the difference becomes more than five, then it becomes a problem of the airway. And if both the plateau and the PIP both rises equally, that means the lung itself is bad. So we do a AVG, the plat is 28 and we find a PCO2 of 66. Now everybody uh, gets worried when they see a PCO2 of 66 and 70. Anil sir, what is your take on that? When you're managing ARDS, how we should uh, target CO2 or should we not target CO2? The pH is, uh, if the pH is uh, 7.26 and the patient is hemodynamically stable and I know that the disease, disease is still in active phase, it has not yet started reversing, I will not make any change. I am happy with this. If the, uh, the PCO2, PO2 of 81, if the FiO2 is high, I will rather reduce FiO2 so that my saturations are around 88 to 92. And I don't want more than 92% saturation. ECO2 of 66 with 7.26 of pH is okay. But keep a close watch on this. IRD ventilation is a, is a very is a very dynamic thing. It's a very common practice that when they see pH to 66, they increase the tidal volume. So if I increase the tidal volume, sir, what will happen to plateau pressure, sir? Plateau pressure, if the lungs are bad, it will increase. Correct, sir. So that that's why we should not. Uh... But if the if the plateau pressure is not increasing with the increase in tidal volume, it means you have you have recruited some of the alveoli. Correct, sir. Correct. I agree, sir. Point well taken. So the thing is, we should not target CO 2s blindly. See the whole patient and see the pH. pH is one. This is what is permissive hypercapnia. So low tidal volume ventilation is the key in ARDS. Patki, are you there, Vinayak Patki? Okay, so I'll direct it to you only. The present AVG now, sir, is pH 7.1, PCO2 of 70, and plateau is 32, sir. Now, how would you like to change the ventilator setting, sir? Uh, PCO2 is 70, 7.1, and PO2 is 21, and plateau is... Uh, so what is the fluid status? Is there a fluid overload in this child? Sir, so what is fluid it? status is okay, okay, sir. There is... There is nothing like that. Okay. Right, sir. So, yes, uh, if you have a leverage, you just increase your tidal volume by 0.5 ml from 6 to 6.5 and see if you can recruit more alveoli. But if the plateau pressure is increasing, then in that case, you have to uh, think of alternative ventilation strategy. And what's about respiratory rate, sir? Can we adjust the respiratory rate? 
What is the rate right now? Uh, it was physiological, sir. We had kept physiological. You can increase, yes. You can increase the uh, respiratory rate, but not to a great extent. So yes. by increasing the respiratory rate, you will increase the minute ventilation. And you may do that. Okay, sir. So that's what we want to highlight over here. So once you're already at a stretch of tidal volume and the plateaus are very high, so you might increase little tidal volume, but over here, increasing respiratory rate might be an option over here, might be an option. So 24 hours, a high peak pressure alarm starts to ring and saturation falls at 86 despite high FR2. So you should always think of a dope. And in dope, uh, always the first thing that you should remove is the equipment failure. That take the patient on a ambu and a tube and see what happens. And if you want, don't want to remove it, you can look at the graphics also. And that graphics will help you in reducing what you are dealing with. So high pressure alarm in a volume mode can be either due to bad lung, tube kink, secretions, or it can be due to your pneumothorax. Now, how do you differentiate between that? A bad lung with the plateau will be high, compliance would be poor, the flat PV loop will be there. In tube kink, we'll find the pressure's peak will rise, but the plateau will be normal, tidal volume will not be delivered, and you'll find something wrong in the circuit. Secretions, you will find some serrations in the expiratory waveform and in pneumothorax, it will be an unstable BP and child would be crashing. So this is a just to highlight, you should know your troubleshooting also once you're using a ventilator. And low tidal volume, it can be either a leak, ET displaced, equipment should be rechecked or it can be your wrong settings that you have not put the alarm settings correct. So if it's a leak, Check for the leak in their scalars. You can see the expiratory is not coming back to zero. It should come here, but it's finishing below that. ET uh, displaced tidal volume will not be delivered. No chest price. Check the flow sensor. And sometimes you put, I put the wrong settings. So this is the X-ray which we commonly get stuck with. Now how to titrate PEEP? There's one more concept you should know of is driving pressure. That is the difference between a plateau pressure and the PEEP. That means this is where you should work on. Keep sufficient PEEP and a low tidal pressure, plateau pressure to keep the driving pressure less than 15. So if you keep a driving pressure less than 15 and a plateau pressure less than 30, you will rarely cause pneumothorax. So increasing PWP and decreasing plateau pressure will push the lung into a safe limit. So that is the importance of driving pressure. And this is how we titrate our PEEP, that uh, if uh, the plateaus are rising, you decrease the tidal volume, increase the PEEP, see the driving pressure, see the compliance, see the ETCO2, see the blood pressure, and at the best possible reading, you adjust your PEEP. So you can do an incremental PEEP or a dec decremental PEEP strategy either. And if your OI is more, then you can go for a rescue therapy. Always consider prone ventilation, HFOV and APRV are not so much preferred. But prone ventilation has done wonders and this is what we commonly practice in our unit. So a higher PEEP, low plateau pressures, low tidal volume, optimal PEEP and a driving pressure less than 15 is a dictum. Permissive hypercapnia in ARDS is good. Fluid restriction after initial restoration is good. Effective sedation and neurovascular blockade can be used in severe ARDS. VAP prevention is important. Prone is important. And now briefly, I'll go for other scenarios in 10 minutes more. In ventilation in shock, you must remember in a shock physiology, you we basically focus on increasing the delivery. That means we increase the FiO2 to the patient. We increase the fluids to the patient. We increase vasoactive agents. We increase the hemoglobin. That means we are working on this part of the engine. Whereas decreasing the metabolic need is also very important in shock. So respiratory efforts eats up almost 20 to 40% energy of a patient. And if we intubate this patient or apply a NIV, it acts like an inotrope in CCF. So therefore, early NIV in shock can be good if your delivery is sufficient and you want to reduce the metabolic needs, then start using NIV and maybe intubate early. So when a child is in catecholamine resistant or when there's organ dysfunction, or this fluid overload, go for mechanical ventilation or NIV. So this is the X-ray that the child usually comes with after repeated fluid challenges. 
the x-ray becomes white because of the leak. We apply NIV, then we apply the intubation. We can go for low tidal volume, high peep strategy. And this is what happens in shock. So beware, if you give too much volume, there is going to be a spill also. So beware of the uh, fill and spill. Now, how to wean? Now, newer guidelines have come up. You should know these guidelines. 2022 guidelines are there. Uh, so there's something called as an ERT bundle. In ERT bundle, you do a SBT. You do a uh, cuff leak test. You check for respiratory muscle strengths. You see the hemodynamic status, sedation level. And after extubation, you might put the patient on HFNC or NIV. So this is the extubation readiness test bundle, out of which SBT is very important. That is spontaneous breathing trial. So a patient, you can uh, give two hours of CPAP or one hour of CPAP and see whether he uh, is tolerating that and can he be extubated. So when should we start weaning? That means when, uh, once you have tided over the crisis and you have reached a plateau in your ventilation, then you start, you should start your weaning. So when there's an escalation of your ventilation, then that is not the time. But when its plateau has reached, then you think of weaning and then you give your SBT trials give sedation holidays, and then you will uh, be able to extubate. So this is, uh, so if, if the patient is ready to be weaned, we give a one SBT and the patient get extubated, a simple weaning. So if there are two SBT failures, it's a difficult weaning. And more than three SBT failures, then it's a prolonged weaning. So you should know in difficult and prolonged weaning how to, uh, you have to go slow in weaning. So there's no tailor-made formula. If a patient is post-op or status epilepticus, maybe quick wean. If the patient is pneumonia, ARDS and MORS, maybe a medium time frame. But if it is a CNS patient poorly nourished, maybe prolonged ventilation will happen. So you can do either a uh, in prolonged weaning, you can either do sprint running, that is you pay, bring the patient to a pressure support mode and uh, you totally tire the patient and then again put it in a control mode. So it's like uh, muscle building. Whereas there's something called as marathon building running, where every day you decrease some pressure support by one and build up the muscles. So in prolonged weaning, either you can do gym-based uh, gym or you can do marathon-based and do SBT and extubate the patient. A brief word about asthma. So this is how an asthma patient looks like. You see the flow, expiratory flow is getting hampered over here despite your therapy. So this is what happens in expiration. The airway gets collapsed, the air gets trapped inside and the CO2 level rises. This is a very severe case and you should intubate late in asthma and extubate early in asthma. Early intubation, good in shock, good in pneumonia, but late intubation is a dictum in asthma because once you intubate, you will land up in problem because over here, the strategy is very, very confusing. So if you see the FRC is decreased in ARDS, the compliance is low, this is optimal, but again in asthma, the compliance is low because in the top of the curve. So at both the places, the compliance is low. Here the lung cannot be distended any further. Here the lung cannot be expanded in ARDS. So they're two different physiologies, but both have low compliance. So this is the PEEP we apply is extrinsic. This is the PEEP which is there in the patient which is intrinsic that is due to disease and this is a total PEEP that we give to a patient. Now I'll not confuse you more. I'll just give you some dictums that use lower tidal volume because if you give high the more amount of air will get trapped. You use low rate because if you give high rates targeting CO2 the more air will get trapped in. I ratio start with 1 is to 4. If you have paralyzed the patient you can give 0 or 2 PEEP. And then the higher PEEP, some people give, some units do not give. But monitor pressure, monitor your plateau pressures. And this is how you, and this is how you diagnose uh, auto PEEP in your graphics. This is a flow time scaler. The first one, this is a normal. The expiration has touched baseline. And this is the one where the expiration has not touched base. This is the amount of air that is getting trapped in asthma. Every breath you give, some amount of air gets trapped in it. So this is a video which is demonstrating. You can see over here, the expiratory waveform is not touching zero. The peak pressure is 23. 
So this is the expiratory, not touching zero, and the next breath comes in. Not touching zero, next breath comes in. And the peak pressure is 24. And we are giving a peep of four, rate of 21, and tidal volume 255. Okay. It, it's not getting... Okay. So what? It's not play getting played. Okay. Or you can apply an expiratory hold. So once I apply an expiratory hold, you can see this is the auto peep. You can see the PWP rising. So this is the extrinsic peep that we get four over here. Intrinsic peep four. This is the intrinsic peep. So this is the expiratory hold. So this is how it appears. So inspiratory hold for plateau, expiratory hold for in intrinsic peep. And this is the concept of giving some amount of peep for these airways because if you do not give external peep, the airways won't open and the lungs will not get deflated. So we need this alveoli to get deflated. So we need to give some amount of PWP so as to open this and it gets deflated. And you should know about how to deliver your nebulizers with the circuit. With that, sir, I finished seven minutes before. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Maninder. Um, that was a very, very, uh, you know, bird's eye view of mechanical ventilation or basics of ventilation and you have made it uh, more interesting uh, with the with the case presentation. You, you, you took us through a case of ARDS and briefly through the shock and asthma. But you have given the basics of, uh, you know, for the initiation of ventilation in a disease state especially. So that was a very good talk and uh, intermittent interaction with me was also useful. So I was also awake throughout the talk. <laughs> I did not mute myself and went away for the dinner. So it was good. And uh, But I just want to say that ventilation is one aspect. Critical care is not ventilation. Critical care is much more than that. Much more than that. A child who's on ventilator, of course, is critically sick. But then you cannot ignore the, the, the basic monitoring of intake output because we have seen, as you have shown the x-ray, the fluids given more fluids and the next day the x-ray was white. So it can happen in any child. It can happen in any child. So very strict fluid monitoring. All these patients who are on ventilator with the bad lungs should have foleys in. And especially the, you know, the inotropes, everything, the... The more you play with the ventilator, the more hemodynamic problems are bound to occur. And you should know how to handle those hemodynamic problems. So that's very important. And where is the limit? When do, when should you say, okay, friend, I cannot manage this patient. Now we have to send this child to the tertiary level center where no other modalities are available. So before patient goes from single organ failure to multi-organ failure because of persistent hypoxemia, or because of the, the because of the uh, uh, lung overinflation or lung injury, I think one should understand the limit and uh, you know uh, send the patient to higher centers for the ventilation. True, sir. Exactly true, sir. Mm -hmm. I've seen one more practice, sir. FiO2 of 80 and FiO2 of 90 and HFNC is going on. So, do you agree with that practice? Not at all. Not at all. I think HFNC is very, very badly used. It is overused and it is delaying the use of invasive ventilation. A child who initially we all start with the high FiO2, but we have to reduce it. We have to reduce maintaining saturation of 92% with 90% FiO2 doesn't make sense at all. I mean, you are just looking at the, at the saturation part. You are not looking at the supply of oxygen, how much oxygen you are supplying to the patient. So one has to interpret the blood saturation, such as SpO2, in context of the FiO2. You cannot just look at the saturation. You have to look at the FiO2. So that is the reason why I believe that there is a... The HFNC is very comfortable. It's very... It's loved by everyone. The patient loves it. The doctor loves it. The nurses love it. But... Uh, but it is misused and it is creating problem for many of the patients. I agree. So I think so. It's abused now. 
it is it's being yeah. abused because everybody is using hfnc for sometimes no reason and sometimes for a extreme of a case also where they are referring it very late intubating there, really are, late. there are many patients who can be managed with simple oxygen and they are also given hfnc i agree sir both sides is bad so given a choice if a patient needs uh, uh, hfnc and nasal cpap sir in which particular subset would you prefer a nasal cpap uh, in myocardial dysfunction, mild myocardial dysfunction with pulmonary edema, where it is a parenchymal disease, because you see the HFNC is a is a flow based device, while <laughs> NIV or CPAP they are pressure based devices. So when I'm setting a pressure of CPAP of five or six, I'm sure that that much CPAP is at the alveolar level, but when I'm setting HFNC of two liter per kg per minute. I am not sure how much CPAP is there. In dogs, they have shown 4 cm, 5 cm at the pharynx. But what actually is happening at the alveolar level, uh, we don't know. So, if you look, if you if you uh, analyze the uh, literature of HFNC, all the publications, the maximum benefit is in the bronchiolitis. The reason being the bronchiolitis is an airway disease. Airway disease, not a parenchyma. Yes, I agree, it's well taken, sir. So, 90% of patients of mild to moderate air bronchiolitis will be saved by HFNC. But if you look at the pneumonia, which is a parenchymal disease, which is a disease of parenchyma where the alveoli are affected and presumably the airways are okay. So, there the success rate is 40 to 50%. And sir, what is your take on a dengue patient, sir? If a dengue patient develops respiratory distress, HFNC versus NIV, sir? Dengue is a complex situation. Dengue is a complex situation. You, you have to individualize at that bedside key what I need to use. But I, if the patient has flooded lung, I will prefer non-invasive ventilation. Yes, I will prefer clear. NIV. So NIV versus intubation in dengue patient, sir? Which is your take, sir? You would prefer NIV. late intubation or early intubation in dengue, sir? If the patient is not, I will I will try NIV. I will try NIV for an hour or so, but I will be standing at the bedside. I will not go for coffee. Correct. That is most important. And sir, that, have... I, that is very important. You put a device and you don't stand there to look at the good effect or bad effect of a device. Okay. Your patient is gone. And we we have Anupam sir here, sir. In onco patient, sir, HFNC or NIV. Again, it would depend, you know, because if you you have a patient who's got infection, has got gone into ARDS, then of course your HFNC won't work. Uh, what would work uh, more uh, is NIB, uh, uh, you know, NIBP, uh, this thing. So, I, I mean, it all depends upon those situations, but majority of our patients, when they get into this kind of a problem, are usually having uh, ARDS kind of a situation. Uh, once in a while, you have fluid overload uh, in patients who are being given, who are undergoing uh, HSCT when they get into, uh, you know, uh, sinusoidal disease and all those things. So that's when you uh, get fluid overload. Otherwise, it's always ERDS kind of a situation. Anupam, sir, I'll be a devil's advocate. Maninder, the most important, the most important step that everybody forgets is to stratify the patient. Thank you me. have to stratify the patient, where my patient belongs, and then select the device. Correct, sir. Correct. Anupam, sir, I'll be a devil's advocate. I'll just ask you a question. May, uh, sir, is there a thing that many hemato-oncologists say that you apply NIV or you intubate late, or the patient gets shifted from ward to PICU late? I just want to ask. No. You ask me this question. No, no, I Why are you asking, asking Anupam? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you so asked me this question. Why are so you that... asking Anupam? I am the one who is receiving. Because <laughs> <laughs> so I feel this in every center, sir, most of the time. Every center. Every center. Every center. That is why we get ARDS, severe ARDS, onco patients, whenever they, come, when they, whenever they come to the ICU. Yeah, yeah. And now, nowadays, sir, uh, Himato Onco have started their own uh, ICUs also, sir. I told Anupam to make Onco ICU. I will support, give full support. I will put my fellows there. Great. I have given him option. We will we'll do that now. <laughs> we need we need two, two or three bed PI Onco ICU. That's all. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
the i'm telling you the outcome will change yeah, so that i think many of the units are doing it now everybody has a onco icu and gets same yes show. yes many many patient units where the mat onco is very strong they have uh, onco icu we'll do it next year because uh, we'll by that time we'll have more uh, fellows because we are getting converted into a three years course so once we have more fellows we can sort of position somebody there along with your people and help out you know anita can we take few questions uh, yes, on the yes, chat sir, i'll ask the questions sir. i'll ask the questions so uh, in you, difficult you airway, see whatever you want to answer an anticipated difficult airway holding paralyzing agent is looks justified so you want to answer sir okay in such a situation you have to collect your team collect all the equipments and don't delay the intubation if the patient needs it correct so if, correct sir so a, a difficult airway is a separate game this is we are what yes. we're talking in a routine you, difficult airway if you have anticipated you have to collect all your armatorium and uh, collect your team that's the basic thing so somebody has asked where and how to look for compliance so on the ventilator screen on the side you will find this compliance c coming and uh, you can see the, most of the compliance that you see in the ventilator will be dynamic compliance and that is sufficient for us any time you recruit you look at the dynamic compliance in a shock patient uh should we give bolus before ketamine or after ketamine okay there is nothing fix answer huh, or both sir no you can we can give both but if the ketamine is there if the child is in shock then the fluid is the first choice correct fluid has to be given Ah, so it's nothing fixed. It's a little dynamic. You can give a small inotrope also. Yes, uh, absolutely. So, uh, a basic question has come, sir. What about trigger? So, trigger in many ventilators are basically flow triggered now. Pressure triggered is almost obsolete. So, shift to flow trigger. Flow trigger will be always in positive. Pressure trigger would be in negative. So, in pressure trigger, both the inspiratory and expiratory valve will get closed, and only when a certain pressure or like you said minus two. then only the inspiratory valve will open and but in that many second the patient will have a flow starvation and it's not good so we have moved away from pressure trigger we usually go for flow trigger and uh, flow trigger again the sensitivity changes from machine to machine anything nearer to zero will be highly sensitive and that means easy for a uh, patient to take a breath and away from zero would be difficult to take a breath uh mad acha dr neelam is also come Uh, ma'am has told i have worked with anil sir and he will never go for coffee because he is always busy managing a sick patient and i have already told how to calculate a plateau pressure yeah you know maninda yes sir a few years back when uh, we uh, you know when we started at chcct that is about 20 years back people used to say that there's no need of an intensive care unit for an chcct a uh, unit which is a transplant unit because if you have to shift your patient into a icu it's a goner that's what the feeling was but now i mean over the last few years over the last few de uh, uh, a decade or so we've seen that we have salvaged so many of our patients uh, by shifting them early into the icu rather than this thing and we are not scared and anil and his team have provided excellent cover and they have always used the uh, isolation room in our uh, you know pcu to handle the patients so uh, things have changed and they are so dynamic they are changing day uh, every day so i think we have to take that into consideration when we are talking about i mean i uh, i remember i was talking to mamin chandi and he said what are you talking about if your patient gets it shifted into the icu he's not going to be saved so that's the kind of a feeling it was there you know correct sir Now, nowadays uh, if the unit has a trust in icu then it, the early shifting is also taking place and yeah. antibiotics yeah. stewardship prevention infection control have all gone very high nowadays sir the quality is really improved i think both the chairpersons have left because they had some meeting or the other to attend uh, you know so hello and dr dankar could you please uh, uh, give the vote of thanks to the 
Chairpersons and all. Sir, uh, absolutely a wonderful talk by uh, D.M. Maninder and Aliwal Sahab. <laughs> no doubt about it. So it was really wonderful. But um, uh, my apologies that we won't take up the ICU issue from the event on the side. You would uh, definitely have to help us. <laughs> we are not going to totally take up. <laughs> so my apologies up front. So uh, Dr. Neelam is also with us. Would you like to say something, ma'am? Ma'am, you, you have to unmute. You have to unmute, ma'am. Yeah, I'm sorry. I said mm -hmm. I've been attending from the beginning. I saw uh, him blowing the balloons and all. And I got with both Dr. Anil Sasdeva, and I'm very fond of him. <laughs> mm -hmm. And one both of them. So I couldn't have missed the lecture, and there was a lot to learn today, uh, especially about the HFNC part. Uh, uh, that was a very good tip both the experts gave because all of us deal with critical care and we are always wanting the intensivists not to put them on the ventilator and get back. So that was a very useful tip overall that I found. Thank you. Wonderful. I think, uh, Dr. Dankar, it seems that uh, Menendez's uh, lecture has zapped uh, Neelam. <laughs> no, no. I, was a, I just washed my hair and I thought, uh, but my Sunti Jariti lecture, you know, like, and I said, uh, Kine, it was so useful. And when Anil said, I will not go for a coffee, I've seen him, you know, when my transplant patients used to be there, if he's not comfortable, he will sit there for 60 minutes, 90 minutes, resident will get bored, but he will sit there till he settles the patient. Right. So, right. So, Dr. Sham Sundar, would you like to say anything before we close this session? It's night talk and nothing any specific question from the Dr. Maninda. Right. So once Dr. Maninda talks, nothing is left to be answered or questioned. Wonderful. So uh, on the behalf of Professor Gangaram Hospital and Delhi IAP, I would like to thank all the, the faculties, the dear colleagues and students, specifically Dr. Anupam Sasdeva sir, Anil Sasdeva sir. Sham Sundar, Dr. Neelam Mohan, Dr. Alok Bandaru, who just left, Dr. Pankaj Garg, who is a presenter like Delhi IP, and Dr. Maninda Dhariwal, who gave the talk to us. Thank you very much. Good night. Take care. Thank you very much.